Hi everyone, I'm Joanna Hoffman, Director of Communications at Athlete Ally. We're a nonprofit organization based in the US that works to make sports more inclusive for LGBTQI plus athletes at all levels of sport. And as part of our work, we have a incredible network of Athlete Ally ambassadors who use their platforms to speak up for inequality or against inequality in sports. And I am so thrilled to be here in conversation today with two of our amazing ambassadors. Kaya McCullough and Kelly Lawrence. Um, I could speak for hours about how amazing both of these individuals are, um, but in the interest of time, I'm gonna let them introduce themselves and then we'll go from there to have an awesome conversation about pride in sports and specifically what that looks like in the context of this football versus homophobia event and what that looks like specifically in women's football. Kaya? Hey everybody, I'm Kaya McCullough. I am currently a professional soccer player for the Washington Spirit in Washington, DC, and super thankful to be an Athlete Ally Ambassador and just really excited to be a part of this conversation, so. Um, and I'm Kelly Lawrence. Um, I am the Associate Head Coach at Boston University. Um, I have a little bit of accent, so I apologize right now, it goes in and out. Um, um, I'm originally from England, uh, came over for college soccer and uh, played my college soccer at Indiana University. Great, thank you both so much for being here. Uh, so, Kai, I'd like to start with you. I think that we uh, are really seeing a groundswell of, of athlete activism now, like never before, uh, specifically in the US. I would especially love your take on that, because um, I know that as a college athlete at UCLA, you knelt before games to show your support of Black Lives Matter. Uh, you've spoken up about the importance of centering Black trans lives, uh, and now you're bringing that activism to the pro level. Um, so I was hoping you could tell us a little bit about why it's important for you to speak out about these causes that you believe in. Yeah, it, it's crazy that you talk about it, <laughs> me and my activism in college, because it feels like it's been an eternity but it's actually only been like three or four years um and with all that's going on in the world i think it's really amazing to see how much change is happening and how much more athletes are feeling empowered to speak up about the things that are going on around them um for me i felt really compelled to begin kneeling specifically just because of all the violence against black lives that I was seeing, black and, and brown lives, um, specifically at the hands of police. And it was really hard for me to deal with all the empathy that I was feeling in my heart and not do anything about it. I um, was overwhelmed with emotion at the time when I began kneeling my sophomore year at UCLA. And I just felt really compelled and I think that as athletes, we have a responsibility to use our platform for good. And for me, not kneeling and not doing everything that I could in my power to try and facilitate some sort of change, even if it was super small. Um, I know the market for watching specifically women's college soccer maybe wasn't as big of a scale as some other activism that we're seeing right now is. But for me, any little piece that I could contribute towards making real sustained change was um, helping me sort of relieve that, that grief that I was feeling for my community. So that's kind of where I see athlete activism, I think. I mean, we, we sometimes get dismissed just because we're athletes. I mean, you hear the shut up and dribble um, comments from the media sometimes, but I think before we're athletes, we're human and we have to protect each other. And I think that's where activism really can play a key role in sports. Absolutely. And I think like you mentioned around, you know, the whole shut up and dribble um, stick to sports kind of mentality. There's There's been this misconception that athletes can't be activists when we know obviously that that's not the case. Um, how do you see that changing or do you see that changing right now? 
Oh, absolutely. I mean, right now, seeing with all the MLB games, I mean, I, I'm not an avid baseball viewer, but um, I know that that's a sport that's very um, ingrained in what we like to call American values. I mean, that's the America's favorite pastime. And so for players to be able to um, kneel for the Black Lives Matter movement right now and for them to even be able to show activism with the support of their teams in the league. And I mean, I just saw some comments on Twitter about the Tampa Bay Rays and they were, they were posting statistics, they were doing all this stuff. And so I think that we're really moving into an era where athlete activism is becoming a lot more accepted and almost expected. And I think that's a really key difference because I felt like when I started kneeling, it was very much so you would get blacklisted. I mean, you saw Colin Kaepernick get blacklisted the way that he did, or even my idol, Megan Rapino. She w wasn't called into the national team for a while when she decided to start kneeling, and U.S. soccer created that rule where you weren't allowed to kneel for the anthem. And so I think um, just the fact that at an organizational level, these organizations are rolling back things that they did to prevent athlete activism in the past. I think goes to show that a lot is changing, not just within the players, but kind of bigger picture as well. Absolutely. And I feel like we're seeing that a lot, especially in women's football or soccer, as we say yeah. in the US. Um, yeah, I just think it's it's been incredible to see how many more athletes are speaking up. Um, it's just been like, something that I think we wouldn't have even seen a year ago and we're now seeing with such more moment, momentum. Um, and something that you, you said that I really loved was um, the, I, the fact that athletes are human beings before they're anything else. I think that's such a key point. And, and Kelly, that makes me think about you because I, I know you've had just such an interesting journey as an athlete and now a coach in terms of, you know, really, wanting to bring your full self in, into what you do and, and being visible um, and being a role model to others. Uh, so would love for you to, to speak about that, about kind of your journey from uh, being a pro player in England, coming to the U.S., uh, your work now as a coach and, and what that's been like for you. Yeah, so um, I think if someone had told me I'd even be on, you know, a panel like this or um, speaking so outwardly about uh, my personal life, you know, even five years ago, I, I probably wouldn't have believed it. Um, so I definitely got on a journey. Um, you know, I was fortunate to play for one of the best clubs in, in the country, in, in England. I played for Arsenal, um, gave me the platform to play, you know, with the English national team uh, for all the youth age groups. And there was definitely a time, you know, where it was very apparent that um, if you were gay, um, you, there was something wrong with you. Um, you know, there was judgment, um, whether it was directly or indirectly, you were always asked, you know, um, you know, uh, do you have a boyfriend? If you didn't have a boyfriend, then you must be gay. And then there was like the negative connotations to that. Um, and it was kind of interesting because, um, you know, I don't necessarily, at that time, I wasn't really aware of how I was feeling inside. I wasn't aware of, um, you know, where I, where I was, whether I was gay or wasn't, um, you know, I was just playing football. Um, that's what kind of used to calling it. I've gotten into the soccer mode for the last 13, 14 years, but every now and again. Um, so um, it really wasn't until I came to the U S to, to play college soccer. And I, I really found, um, you know, a lot more safety and um, support within um, my friends, you know, in my college environment and going back to, um, a national team team camp and there was almost this dramatic shift and now it was, it was a lot more a lot safer there was a lot more a lot more players who were out um, and uh, it was it, I remember it being this dramatic shift where I was like oh so it, it's okay now um, and uh, you know I don't I and it's hard for me because I've also lived most of the last 14 years in the U.S. so um, I guess there was shifts happening in England that I wasn't aware of. Um, and so coming back into camp and, and actually having a girlfriend at the time and being, you know, feeling comfortable to say it because there were these little signs and little conversations and, um, and seeing other people being visible that made me feel confident to be able to, um, to, 
when asked the question to say, yes, I have a girlfriend. Um, and for people to actually be excited. And that was not the case, you know, maybe two, three years prior to that. So um, that's kind of what I kind of went through um, in terms of just, you know, being in a national team environment and feeling that it, you know, it wasn't something that was acceptable and, and to keep, if you were to keep it quiet um, to a few years later, then feeling like actually it was now like almost like the cool thing. Um, so then, um, you know, going to a place where, you know, I felt very supported, um, with my team, with my, um, with my friends that were not athletes, um, and then going into the professional world. So coming out of playing college soccer, being, being done playing professionally and going into the working world and, and coaching. And, um, you know, that's when the insecurity started to come out again, because I wasn't in an environment every day that was saying it's okay um, to be who you are. Um, you know, I, Ellen DeGeneres was someone that I looked up to, um, but she was so far removed from, from me in my life. So, um, you know, I, I didn't have a lot of people in my life that were visible, that were role models to me, that were people that, um, were coaching and were gay. I didn't have those, those connections. And so, um, you know, the insecurities that I was having about who I was and society telling me that, um, it's not okay or, um, you know, I, I didn't have other female coaches that were gay that I could say, well, how have you handled this? Like, have you, have you dealt with any, um, backlash from parents or, um, have you had players who have been uncomfortable with coaching you? And a, a lot of that was just my own inside being worried. I was so focused on wanting to be the best coach that I could possibly be and being worried, um, because I just didn't have, you know, you know, signs that it was going to be okay for me to do that. Um, and then kind of fast forwarding to, um, you know, one of my last times at Syracuse University and um, a student athlete, um, you know, w was, was going through some problems where uh, she wasn't feeling, she was starting to figure out who, who she was, you know, in terms of her sexuality. And she wasn't feeling like she had, she had anybody in her life that she could talk to about it. And, um, you know, me, me having a conversation with her and, and, and realizing that the space that we had was not supportive enough in our athletic department. Um, and it kind of was that nudge to me that we need to do more. We need to make this, you know, the athletic department, the um, competitive environment that we're in, we needed to make it safer and more supportive um, so that every single student athlete felt valued. So that was everybody that in my head, that was, that was everybody. Um, and um, that kind of pushed me to kind of look at our mission statement as an athletic department. Are, are we actually um, doing what we say, say we're doing or doing what we, we say we're, we're about? So um, and that and, and in a way that that nudge from that student athlete was um, a nudge that made me realize I needed to be visible um, because, you know, kind of flashbacking to what I didn't have. Um, and, and so then that that led me to being a lot more um open and when I was asked you know about what I did on the weekend um I didn't omit the fact that I was with my girlfriend you know I didn't just say I went to the driving range I went to the driving range with my girlfriend and I and and through that I got more comfortable more comfortable and, and started to realize that there were a lot of people in my life who were very supportive we just hadn't broke those barriers so um you know in, in that way I think um you know I, I'm so thankful for that student athlete um Hopefully, I'm trying to continue to do the work to, to, to make environments in you know, every athletic department I'm part of, you know, more supportive. Um, but she gave me probably more than than I think I was able to do. So That's amazing. I mean, I, I think that, you know, something that we see when we're tracking how inclusive athletic departments are, a big part of that is having uh, is having coaches who are out and visible. So, I mean, I think that's just so important. Having, having athletes know that they have someone they know they can talk to, they know is not going to judge them, um, and that is going to have their back. Um, can you just speak a little bit about what else colleges can be doing to make LGBTQI plus students feel more welcome and included? Yeah, definitely. So um, I think the easiest thing is to just check the box and just have your standard educational workshop with, um, you know, outside um, organizations um, and then just leave it there. Um, you know, when we were at, when I was at Syracuse, we were able to bring in LGBT Sports Safe and the commitment was made that 
every single coach was going to be in the room, every single you know administrator was going to be in the room, that the senior leadership were going to was was going to have some some workshops or two, um, as well and committed to that. And it wasn't just the case of, all right, we've got to do this workshop for all the 600 student athletes we have um, and make sure that they're on board, but then not have have the leadership involved. Um, so I think there has to be that commitment. Um, the way that I was able to communicate it um, was I actually took the mission statement um, that we had and the values that we had. And I looked at it and I, I pointed out three, three of the values that we had that were not, were not, um, were not when we weren't doing, um, we weren't taking into consideration diversity. We weren't taking into consider, consideration inclusion. There, there were multiple aspects of our mission, uh, mission statement that we, we weren't, um, doing effectively. There was no visibility. Um, and so that was a really easy way for me to communicate versus going in there and going in with a lot of emotions and a lot of feelings. So if, if, you know, I would say if you are a staff member, if you are a coach, um, and if you are an administrator, um, you know, you can kind of look back at, you know, mission statements and values that we've been putting in your face constantly and just say, and relate straight back to what we're saying we're about, um, because no one can really argue with that. Um, so that would be kind of the first two parts is, you know, don't just do the check the box, like get everybody in the room, but then it's continued follow up. Um, so, um, fortunately at BU, we have, um, the athlete ally chapter. Um, but our senior women's administrator is involved in, in that group. So we have an administrator that's actually involved with the athlete ally chapter. Um, she attends, attends meetings whenever it's, um, appropriate. Um, she has been involved with Athlete Ally, communicating with them and getting them to come on um, onto campus. Um, so I think having administrators that um, hopefully care about it just because they should, but you know, talking to them and making sure that they know why it's important um, to have those kind of groups for student athletes. Um, so those those things I would say. Um, and then I had one other thought earlier. Um, so in terms of coaches, I think one of the big things we can do is um, when we have a team meeting, um, give up the floor to your student athletes. If they're a part of an athlete ally group or a student athlete of color group or whatever other groups that are going on within your athletic department, give up the floor, give five, 10, 10 minutes for them to communicate in front of the team. Um, you know, you can do team bonding activities, um, but then you could do activities that are actually um, aimed at actually having some some really good dialogue about some uncomfortable things. Um, so I think there, there's there's in our spaces we can still achieve the things we want to do as coaches, which is have our student athletes be better at communicating, have them have them um, grow as leaders. But we can do those things in um, you know in environments that are actually going to affect some change. Um, so those are those are a few of the ways that I think that um, administrators and coaches can can better support student athletes. Um, one of the things that I've thought about doing is, you know, I do go to workshops, I do go to events. Well, let the team know I'm going to go and, and, and open the floor. Hey, does anybody want to come with me? And they may not want to, but just knowing that you're going, I think helps. Um, it's not a case of saying, you know, saying to everybody, like, I'm, I'm doing something great, but it's a case of just making sure that communication is open and that, that they know that you're, you're about it. Um, those are a few of the things that I've kind of seen work and then, um, we're, we're, we're working on to. Thank you. That's so important. I mean, I, I especially think the point you made about the fact that, you know, a policy can exist, but if it's not being followed, what good is it? You know, it's like, it's so important that we have these policies that are actually being uh, rolled out in a way that has an impact and uh, that is meeting the needs of the students it's aiming to support. I just think that's such an important point. Um, and I think, you know, something we've really seen in the past year is just the power of, of student athletes. Like you said, they, you know, they know what they want. They know what they believe. They need to be given a platform to be able to speak um, and share that. Uh, this past year, Athlete Ally had our, our first ever uh, student athlete activism summit, um, which was a, a summit where we brought together student athlete activists from across the country to come together and talk about kind of best practices, strategies for athlete activism. And I think just seeing all of those students in the room together really just reinforced that for me even more. I mean, I think um, there's just so, so much power in student athletes um, and especially when they're 
really given the, the resources and the space to, to speak out. Um, so Kaya, I would love to, to turn back to you here with that. Um, and I think you, you know, you as, as a as student athlete activism, you know, we're just so tremendously powerful. Um, and I'm hoping you can speak a little bit about what challenges student athletes face um, when they want to speak out, um, when they want to be confronting these issues of systemic racism and homophobia, um, but either they're not finding institutional support or, or they're meeting other challenges along the way. Yeah, that's like a really complex, I think, kind of loaded question because I feel as if my experience probably differed a lot from what other student athletes may experience or have experienced. I went to an institution that supported what I was doing and it was made very clear to me from the beginning that I would receive the support of my athletic department and um, on a smaller front, my coaching staff, I, my head coach was the first person I went to besides my parents where I was like, I wanna start kneeling. And I think I was really, we talked about giving student athletes the space to really speak about what they care about. And I was really, I was given that without a question and without hesitation. And I feel like that is one of the challenges that a lot of student athletes may face is not even having the opportunity to necessarily speak out about what they want to. And I feel as if another level of that is like, when you're, when you're a student athlete, you're in this position of like, you're getting your education paid for either in full or um, partially and you don't want to do anything to necessarily rock the boat or to risk your education or to risk your position on the team, risk your starting spot, uh, whatever it may be. You're, you're putting yourself out there for a lot of criticism and a lot of backlash because it, at the point of being a student athlete, you, it's not your career. Like now as, I'm, now as I am a professional athlete, I have more autonomy over the decisions that I make and things that I say. Um, whereas when you're a student athlete, everything is very closely monitored and you very much have to stick to kind of the rules and the regulations of the university that you represent. And so I feel like that's another way that there, there are sort of barriers to why student athletes may not want to actively engage in activism outrightly. And it's a very real, real fear. And like I said, I can only imagine some of the experiences that other student athletes had to go through um, when trying to kind of ignite their own activism because I was not met with that. And I feel like if we do take steps towards making sure that student athletes feel empowered and safe to speak out about what they really feel deeply about, then that's a step in the right direction because I mean, in my own experience, I, I started my activism not really thinking that it would make much of a difference. It was more kind of a personal thing. Like I just, I felt compelled to do it. I wanted to make a stand in my own life and the spread that it's had up to this point has been more than I could have ever imagined. And so seeing myself, what small actions, that small actions can have just such big consequences, I think. If we were to give that platform to every single student athlete, imagine the change that we could make. Um, so, I don't know. A lot of times I feel like student athletes may just feel like a single drop in the puddle, but I think that allowing the puddle to get bigger is, is something that we can all do a little bit better. Absolutely, because I, I think like you're saying, I mean, I think when one person speaks out, it then makes it easier for the next person to speak out. You know, it really it becomes this uh, this ripple effect. Not to steal yeah. your water metaphor, but um, it's kind of a lame metaphor. But no, yeah. it works though. I mean, but yeah, I think that it makes a lot of sense. I think it's about really kind of changing the culture of what we expect of athletes, right? And like what we see athletes as kind of being set out to do. Um, I think something you, you said earlier was around the idea of, of athlete activism not just being um, accepted, but also expected. I mean, I think that's something that we 
feel so strongly um, at Athlete Ally that, you know, we just see time and time again, the way that athletes can reach people across geography, across politics, um, and really change hearts and minds. So I think there's just tremendous potential there. And yeah. if athletes can start to realize that when they're young and when they're, you know, students, um, that's even better. So. Yeah, I really think that sports are really a unifying thing across cultures, across religions, across age, gender, um, sexuality, race. Like it's sports are so unifying. And I think that allowing the people who are the most notable in those positions to have the power to really affect changes is something that can be so, so powerful. So I, I like the direction that it's going. There's definitely still more that needs to be done, but I think in this past year, what with COVID and I mean, everything that's going on with our president and with the Black Lives Matter movement, it's just, you're starting to see change and it's really exciting to be a part of. Absolutely. Um, well, I, I'm mindful of the time um, and I think we've just, we've had such a rich conversation. I'm just so grateful to both of you. Um, I just think we, we touched on so many important points here around the power of athletes speaking out, the, the power of visibility, um, really the, the future of athlete activism, which I think is bright. Um, before we close, um, would love to know from either of you or both of you, um, if you could leave the folks watching this video right now with one takeaway, what would it be? You want to go? <laughs> um, I think, do you, do you mean take away from this conversation or just kind of, um, I mean, I, I think it kind of goes to um, a little bit of what Kai is saying. Like, I think there's been a feeling as a coach um, that, you know, we're, and speaking specifically to soccer, like we're just here to be soccer, soccer coaches and just teach soccer. And, you know, um, and then what happens is when you question a coach about that and you ask them, you know, you know, well, is it about leading as well? And then I say, yeah, of course it's about leadership. Um, and then, you know, starting to probe there and, and realize that you're leading, especially for me, like we're leading these young women. Um, and so we have to allow them to be leaders. Um, and I think one of the things that I'm most proud of is I think we as a program have made a shift from just trying to lead them as, um, you know, as, uh, as young women, we're lead, we're, tr we're trying to create platforms so that they can really, really lead themselves in all areas. Um, and that means that if they are passionate about, um, about something that we, um, not only just say, okay, it's, yeah, it's okay for you to go forward and, and say whatever you say, but create that platform. Um, one of the, one of the things that we we've done recently is we've created an anti-racism group within our, with our team. Um, and, We've said, you know, whoever wants to, to be a part of it, um, you know, let us know, um, but we're not going to lead it. We're going to support you. We're going to give you the resources. We're going to do whatever we can to give you that platform um, and guide you, um, you know, but, you know, this is, this is going to be something that you, you know, you can own and you can be leaders, but also being there to support them, not just leaving them kind of on an island. So um, I think to to, to a lot of what Kaya said, which, you know, you're, you're such an impressive young woman. I know you're in the pro, pro ranks right, right now. I'm a little bit older than you, but um, I think it's important from the coach's standpoint to, um, to take some time and reflect and just sit back and um, see how much more you can do um, and how much more you can do to support the student athletes and um, giving, a, giving them a platform um, and trusting them with that. I, I think only good things are gonna happen. Um, something that I would probably say to people is, <laughs> I'm not going to use the same metaphor that I just came up with, but kind of along the same line is like every single person has a platform, whether it's bigger, whether it's smaller, whether it's through sports, whether it's in your workplace, whether it's in your family, you have a platform to really affect change and to influence the people around you. And so I say speak up and don't be afraid to speak up because there are plenty of people who will support you, who have your back and who appreciate the work that you're doing, even if it's small. And 
something I have really reflected on during this quarantine when I was becoming really immensely emotionally exhausted with just trying to educate people and trying to I don't know just every day like do something more like I was like what more can I be doing sometimes just having simple conversations like this is is activism it's it's even though it seems small the everyday things that you do can affect change and so that's probably the message that I would want to give because that's something that I've come to terms with in my life like it doesn't have to be these grand gestures of um kneeling for the national anthem or um going to protest like there are things that you can do in your everyday life that have the potential to influence those around you so just make sure that you're 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 living your life authentically and trying to emulate in your everyday actions the sort of activism that you want to bring to the world that is such a good point because yeah i mean i, I feel like um, not to go off on a tangent, but I feel like especially during a pandemic, there are people who feel like, you know, they, they're scared to go to protest, but they want to support the movement, you know, and just, I think, like you said, just realizing there are so many ways uh, to be taking action, to be speaking out, to be giving resources to activists and organizations on the ground, um, to be having conversations that need to be had. Um, I just think, like you said, there's so many ways to do that. Um, and yeah, just to close by saying how grateful we are um, at Athlete Ally to have such an amazing network of ambassadors who use their platforms to speak out, who uh, really believe that sports can and should be a place for everybody. Um, it's just, we're so honored uh, to have you two as ambassadors. So thank you so much for the work that you do. Uh, thank you for being a part of this conversation and thank you to everybody tuning in. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thanks for having us.